I've interviewed a lot of people who have lived through a civil war, and they all say the same thing. I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming. Absolutely, people are angry, and you can feel it. You can feel the, the rage, the madness. Oklahoma City broke wide open when a terrorist truck bomb changed us forever. Razor wire defense lines were reinforced Wednesday in Eagle Pass, with the federal government still not sure exactly which areas along the border Texas will let federal agents access, and the Texas governor not giving an inch. It's time for Florida to be its own country. Well, here's why Florida's breaking away from the U.S. is not only nearly impossible, but it's a bad idea. One, Florida would no longer have a military. Two, we would lose all of our federal money for things like education. And three, this would become useless. Florida would need its own currency. We'd become the equivalent of a third world country. Public opinion on Californian independence has never neared a majority. But there have been enough fringe movements seeking secession that the question has been included in legitimate political polling, reliably demonstrating surprising support for the idea. Between 14 and 32% of respondents were for Californian nationhood. It's time we talked about it. It's time that we considered what another potential civil war in America might look like. Are we heading in that direction? Now, surely we can avoid that, right? Right? Let me share my take on this. More importantly, let's discuss this and try to find real practical solutions that you can begin to implement now to prepare if the unthinkable were to occur in our country. Download the Start Preparing Survival Guide to help you prepare for any disaster. I'll post a link in the description and comments section below or visit cityprepping.com forward slash get started for a free guide to help you get started on your journey of preparedness. If you're new to this channel, my name is Chris, and on this channel, we discuss emergency preparedness, aka prepping. Um, <clears throat> when I first started preparing, I was trying to get ready primarily for natural disasters that might occur. Uh, the area that I live in is very prone to a lot of natural disasters, and it's just kind of a common thing for many of us in this area to just prepare. It's, it's uh, encouraged even at local levels. But over the last 10 years, however, I've begun to prepare increasingly more for man-made disasters as I've watched hostilities, animosities, and rhetoric flare up. I mean, look at the events of the last several years. We have good reason to feel frustrated and, more importantly, to <clears throat> be concerned about our collective future. We have had a pandemic. We had lockdowns, which resulted in losing valuable time that we can never get back. We watch our supply chain fall apart. We had contested elections. We're witnessing war in Ukraine in the Middle East. We have witnessed shouting matches on television and grocery stores and local school board meetings and from so many political platforms that we often forget that compromise and unity are not dirty words, but principles that we once lived by and we are encouraged to strive for. And it sometimes seems as if people have lost their minds with anger and demonizing others. But sometimes we've forgotten how to find common ground through discussion. And many people find a villain in everything, questioning every motive, spreading misinformation faster than they spend time discerning the truth. Now, the acclaimed director Alex Garland's movie Civil War premiered at South by Southwest and will soon be open at theaters nationwide. It's an election year release of a violent vision of a near future America at war with itself and honestly, based on the trailers, doesn't feel too far from what we're witnessing in our country right now. But that's just Hollywood. We must ask ourselves if that could happen here and if we are clearly heading in that direction. Though theatrical representations of events, they vary widely, we should consider this movie at least, if anything, a conversation starter. Do we really want to go there? Can we bridge divides to prevent that outcome? And I think some of those people who would like to see a civil war or state succeed maybe don't really understand the full cost of war. <clears throat> As I've shared many times on this channel, I have seen what war can do to a country when I lived in Afghanistan in 2003. Uh, but sometimes I feel, and maybe you should as well, that a civil war 2.0 could be in our future, and like an accident you see in a sort of slow motion that you can't look away from. 
And civil wars are rarely fought by the disenfranchised as much as they are fought by those who are convinced that they are disenfranchised. And before I race to arms, or anyone else does for that matter, I would consider what a person loses when wars break out. I mean, we often, again, hear this rhetoric so casually being used in conversations by some of our politicians. But if an event like that were to occur, basically everything that you value will be lost and it will be years before it maybe returns to your life. And maybe it never will. And you may be watching this video right now and say, well, that's fine. Let's bring it on and see this thing through and just throw out the existing systems. But you might want to think that through. I've seen what war does to a country and they rarely emerge better from internal conflicts for generations. The consequences are not merely transient, but they're enduring, potentially haunting future generations. The allure of upending existing systems, it may seem enticing. Yet the firsthand devastation of war reveals a sobering truth. Nations seldom emerge unscathed from internal strife, grappling with this aftermath for years, if not decades. And before I move on, let me ask anyone watching this who may harbor or entertain those desires. Are you willing to send your son or your grandson into the conflict that you desire? Are you willing to sacrifice your own family? And it's something to think about, especially when sitting in the comfort of your own home and wishing someone else to die on your behalf. But let's move on. When you wake up in the morning to that electric alarm, take a shower, heat some food that you bought last week at the grocery store that was grown in Arizona or California or Peru and shipped to you. When your neighbor's house has a small kitchen fire and you want to call the fire department or you suspect some people are casing your neighborhood or stealing a catalytic converter and you want to call the police. When the neighbor's mean dog escapes his yard and is wandering through the neighborhood and you want to call animal control. When you're injured on the job and you want to contact a lawyer. All of these and more are the frustrations and joys of life. And maybe you've been saving up for a big expense or even retire. But that can all be gone instantly. Do you or one of your family members rely upon a medication to keep them alive? The minute an extensive civil war breaks out in a country, all of these things that you and the generations before you have worked and built are gone. Everything you have and everything you have built for the future will evaporate. You are on your own. You have to be 100% self-sufficient from the food and water you consume to protection and fire services. The laws and order of the land are suspended indefinitely, so don't expect justice, peace, or even to have your grievances heard and addressed. Now look, I know this picture I'm painting is a bleak picture, but it's not out of the realm of possibility just mere minutes after a civil armed conflict breaks out. Whatever militarized forces are fighting amongst themselves, vigilantes, National Guard, militias, private citizens, gangs, the military, or whatever, they don't have time to help you or assist you and they won't be obligated to either. If you don't trust your neighbor, neighborhood, or town right now, do you think you will when the order unravels? If you've been watching even the events in Haiti play out, it's not too dissimilar from what we're discussing here. Again, having witnessed this firsthand, living in a post-collapse nation, uh, the understatement of the year is to say it's pretty bleak. Those with medical conditions, they simply don't make it because there's no infrastructure for them. Life expectancies drop sharply. When I lived in Afghanistan, the average life expectancy was 57 years old, which is not that old. I'm 48 right now, so that would mean I would effectively have another nine years. With every action through your day, every flick of a switch connected to some larger service, every drink of water or every bite of food, you have to ask yourself, how did it get here? Well, it was because of many parts and connections and people that brought that to you. Every link of the chain, because that chain and those links are what's holding your country together. It's probably not worth throwing that out and doing so will result in far more casualties and mere inconveniences. Now look, in the face of such profound upheaval, the folly of discarding established structures, it becomes painfully apparent with the cost of human suffering far outweighing any perceived grievances. A second civil war uh, in America, it's not a foregone conclusion. And there are certainly signs that we, <clears throat> how should I phrase this? There are signs that we could be heading that way. That doesn't mean it has to be. 
Scientific studies, they've shown that when you run the current events in America through the same criteria, you at least have to put America on a watch list of probability that it could happen here. But still, that doesn't mean that it has to. We also have a pretty good track record of coming together when needed. And I may not share the philosophies, politics, or values of all my neighbors on my street block or town, but I don't think that any one of them is trying to destroy our country. And I'm okay with letting them live their life. And even though they disagree with me politically or with so many other views, and look, I just want to live my life. And we both want to enjoy the freedoms of running water, electricity, entertainment, emergency services, uh, safe roads, schools for our kids, and everything else that comes with civil order. And I don't need to suppress his ideas because they're different than mine through violent means. And I'm hoping that you agree. Your neighbors are probably like my neighbors. Um, let me share a personal story for a moment. When I lived in Afghanistan, when I served in poor parts of Mexico back in the 90s on multiple occasions with a team of physicians, and as a side story I'll have to share on the channel one day, I was actually in Tampico and Tamaulipas in 1996, and I ended up having to have an emergency appendectomy in a hospital there, and again, that's a story for another day. But while in those places, I witnessed the same thing. People just wanted to take care of their families, and they wanted to raise their kids in a safe environment. And it was always the same thing, that people were just struggling with the day-to-day -day problems, trying to make sure that their kids had a better life than they did, yet they faced tremendous obstacles. And when I hear the complaints here in the United States, I mean, sure, I get it. We're facing a lot of challenges and they're very real problems, but there's one thing I can guarantee you, we don't have it anywhere near as bad as most of the world. And I would almost dare to say almost all the world. I can only think of a few rare exceptions, but overall, we live like royalty compared to the rest of the world. Again, not to diminish the very real struggles that Americans are facing right now, but I always try to keep things in comparison, but I digress. So what can you do? Our nation's splitting is not inevitable, but if it does, it will be because of the steps we took today. And from a theoretical standpoint, we cannot amplify the screaming voices of discontent over the quieter voices seeking unity and common ground. We can choose to turn down the volume intentionally. Um, I know I have been lately. <laughs> There's a lot of just news that I simply can't listen to, especially when it comes to politics because of the divisive nature and how toxic politics has become as of late. We can choose not to be swayed by algorithms, instead turn off the megaphone that is social media in favor of more thoughtful and meaningful ways to try to learn and come together. If the mainstream media, the news, the pundits, or your endless social media stream leaves you feeling anxious, stressed, or mad, my encouragement is to uh, turn it off for a while. And again, I have. There's even media outlets uh, YouTube channels, individuals that I've watched over the years that I agree with their political position and certain other views. And I even have found myself lately just having to turn them off because I'm admittedly realizing that I've gotten comfortable in an echo chamber and it's caused me to have views that I do not want to have of my fellow Americans. And I realize that if I decide to go back to it, it's still going to be there. And when I, if I just decide to go back to it and what I've just found is when you step back consciously like this, you contribute to a pause in your community where people can relax a bit and ask themselves, do I really want this? Um, I'm recording this on a Wednesday. I'll probably release this on a Sunday, I think. But a couple of days ago, I had a call with a marketing consultant who's helping me with some of the components of the membership area that we're going to be continuing to build out here on my website. She studied my YouTube channel and her analysis showed that I approach my material and how I talk to you, the audience, in a thoughtful and calm manner. And she told me straight up, she lamented that unfortunately very successful influencers, which is a word that I'm personally not comfortable with. I'm not trying to influence people. I mean, if anything, I'm trying to influence you to prepare, but beyond that, I, I just don't like the term. She mentioned that I'm, again, kind of a calm person. I, and she has seen in her line of work that the people that are successful, they tend to be extreme and they focus on eliciting emotions from their audience, especially when they push fear or anger. And I understood where she came from and why she said that, but that's, again, just not who I am. I love my country and sure, I could push buttons. I could get you upset and explain why the other political view is wrong and you're right. I had a call yesterday with an old friend and uh, 
every time we talk, he has to bring up one certain individual that he really, I, I, the word worship would be probably the right word, but this individual is a very controversial individual. And he kept asking, why don't you like this individual? And again, because I, I find that it's hard to talk to people like that because they're so fixated on the individuals that would bring division that I find those, those conversations are usually not constructive. And again, I respect the individual. I don't respect his views on that particular situation, but all that to say, I still find him as an individual that I trust and I respect, but I've been able to separate those two. Do you understand where I'm going with this? And I'm saying all this because I could feed you confirmation bias. I could lie to you. I could go against my values and turn this channel into a show to generate more revenue. And I've watched people do it. But let me tell you, I respect you too much to do that. And I honestly, I couldn't live with myself. Let me move on to the next point here. I would encourage you to find ways to connect with your community. You will enrich your life and potentially the lives of others. Is there a food pantry or library program that you can volunteer for? Can you take an enrichment course to meet others who you share interests with? Have the groups and circles you're in turned somewhat toxic over the last several years, or are they positive? Are they uplifting, life-affirming, and unifying? You really need to, how should I put this? Define who you want in your life, what kind of value they bring, or they don't. And again, I'm not saying kick people out because they disagree on views, but really, do the people in your life, do they add value? I, I think about that a lot with the relationships I have, and I'm very selective on allowing people into my life that it will build me up instead of tear me down. And look, sometimes even the most well-intended groups, they change their philosophies and values over time without even realizing it. And I've seen that happen a lot. Um, I get often asked, you know, am I part of any prepper groups locally? And I've decided to stay out of most of them because most of them have become so political in nature that that becomes the focus. And I found that it may be time to seek something new for yourself. And I found that if a community or a group that I'm involved with begins to go in a negative direction, I have to really assess, is it time to seek a new group or new individuals to surround myself with? And look, it's always hard to sever connections and ties. And the people that I have done that with in the past, again, it's not under hostility. I'm not angry at them. I'm not, I don't see them in a negative way, but it's just, I realize they may not bring value to my life to get me to where I want. And they may be focused on something that I'm uncomfortable being focused on, but that does not make me look down on them. It's just, I realize we're at a different place. And I'm saying all that in the context of this conversation, because again, it's easy to focus on tearing people down focusing on the negative. But again, I've been selective and I still love those that I disagree with. I'll put it that way. And sometimes that may be what's needed to clear the toxic ideas and people out of your life. And again, please don't confuse what I'm saying here. There's a big difference between hating and looking down on others and then realizing that someone may or may not bring value to your life. And I have learned to distinguish those two things. I don't hate or have any ill will against those that I disagree with, but I may not want them in my life until they change their views. And again, that may sound like an oxymoron, even as I say it out loud, but I think there's a very fine line that we've lost in our country where it's gone from, I disagree and I don't want that around me to, I hate that individual and wish ill will. And that's a very big difference. So let me try to land this plane here. My encouragement is think about it from a practical standpoint. You can prep like services you rely upon from food to water to electricity and medicine that might seize up for a week, two weeks or a month or more. A civil conflict is a man-made disaster, but it can easily be more impactful and life-changing than even the worst natural disasters. You want to focus on what matters most by tending to your resources and skills, and that's you and your family and friends. You focus on the small stuff that unite your group to contribute to the cohesion of the larger group. Will we have a civil war in America? I don't know. And if you had to pin me down on it, and like I tell people all the time, I don't see us being at a point where we see you know massive standing armies or anything like that. But it's clear that we are becoming more and more broken. There are certainly a lot of indicators that are pointing that we are going in a certain direction that eight, nine, 10 years ago would be unfathomable. And look, maybe it's inevitable, but I don't think it has to be. 
I'm certainly not going to resign myself and surrender to that. And as a prepper, we have a little bit of an advantage when it comes to surviving disasters, both natural and man-made. And you can use your preps to your advantage. And I always emphasize that we can't stop what will happen in the future. That hurricane or that tornado barreling down on you, it's not going to listen to your argument about how much you love a roof over your head. These things come for us, and we can't reason with them or always get out of their paths. But what we can do is focus and fortify our own lives. We can harden off our environments to them. And that being said, with this particular disaster of a civil war potentially looming on the horizon, we don't have to sit around and wring our hands and waste our time and energy focusing on what may come. We can instead focus on making ourselves ready. We can build our community to be more resourceful and prepared. And we can lend a hand to others. And this is the most important part. We can find common ground. The choice of directions you want to take is right now. So what do you choose? Well, those are my thoughts on this. So what are yours? Let me know in the comments section below. And this is not the first time we've covered this because this is not the first time this growing sentiment has been so palatable. I would encourage you to take a look at one of our videos from a few years ago, which I'll post a link to here on the side of the screen, which has more details on what you can expect and how you can prepare for Civil War 2.0 if we would ever see that. I watched it again today and it's certainly aging well. What I said, then we have started to see more and more today. And I would encourage you to take a look at that video and let me know what you think. As always, stay safe out there.